So, let's start the next talk by Linus Lüssing and Matthias Schiffer about Gluon. Okay, and, oh, yes, okay. the other ones. Hello and uh, welcome to I think the second talk today and um, yeah this time um, I and Matthias want to talk Matthias and I want to talk about Gluon, a modular firmware framework for your wireless mesh community and yeah um, we both are from Lübeck uh, which is uh, close to Hamburg in the north of uh, Germany and uh, yeah, it's quite rainy there quite often, and so we sometimes hack on some funny stuff. And um, yeah, so we spend some time in the hackerspace there and um, uh, the Chaoticum, and yeah. So uh, just to avoid some confusion, um, so uh, the right one, that's the Freifunk logo, the left one, that's the Gluon logo, scaled one to one. Um, it's quite tricky to uh, capture a gluon because it's so small. So, but, well, there it is. <laughs> okay. Today, um, Matthias will start off with uh, a small introduction of what gluon is and what an gluon. And later, uh, I will continue with the features we currently have within gluon. And um, yeah, finally, we have some demos to also show you how it looks like for maintainers, users, and so on. Okay. Yes. Okay. So let's let's start with what. <laughs> okay. So let's start with what Gluon actually is. So as uh, the title already said, Gluon isn't a firmware, but it's a firmware framework. So, what does it mean? There is not one. Uh, uh, there is not one way to build a gluon firmware, but it, which is something like a build system. It's a source distribution that allows to um, build a firmware for build a firmware for a single mesh community. Uh, adjusted uh, t to the likings of the people building the mesh network. Um, yeah, it's it, the primary focus of Gluon is community mesh networks, but it has also been used for some other projects. For example, there was a Richards project that was building its its its, its mesh network uh, using Gluon to make uh, underwater vehicles um, communicate. So, as uh, you probably have guessed, uh, Gluon is based on OpenWRT lead. Um, and, well, basically there are two parts of Gluon. It's a wrapper around the build system of OpenWRT and lead, and there are lots of custom packages that make Gluon actually do the things we want to, to actually do the meshing. So, there are a lot of different projects that try to achieve something similar to, to um, make it easy to build up mesh frameworks. So, you might ask, why does Gluon even exist? So, uh, we'll turn back the clock a few years and uh, look at the starts of the Gluon project. So, back in 2012, um, there was some new interest in Freifunk and mesh networks in some places in Germany. One of them was Lübeck. Back then, the Freifunk Lübeck project was still very young and had maybe uh, between 10 and 20 nodes. Um, well, we were one of the communities that were experimenting with the Batman Advance protocol. Um, and it seems we did something right with our Lübeck Freifunk firmware. We, had some nice features that uh, other similar firmwares were lacking. We had uh, VPN connections to connect mesh clouds. 
we had an auto app data, things like that. So some other communities noticed our firmware and thought, hmm, there's a neat piece of software. Let's use it. So as it wasn't really possible to adjust uh, the firmware for their needs easily back then, they forked our Lübeck Freifunk firmware. So at some point, um, there were probably uh, five or six uh, independent forks of uh, the Lübeck Freifunk firmware going around. So at first Kiel forked from Lübeck, then Hamburg forked from Lübeck, then I think Köln forked from Hamburg, then Frankfurt forked from Köln, and at some point Chemnitz forked from Frankfurt, or something like that. I don't know the exact ordering. Um, well, so at some point, uh, at the end of uh, 2012, we noticed these forks and knew we needed to do something. So at uh, the start of 2013, um, we started the Gloom project uh, with the goal to reunite these forks, to join forces of all these uh, independent developers that uh, were all trying uh, to build Batman Advanced based mesh firm firmworks for their communities. Okay, so here are some of the principles that uh, we uh, deployed when we, uh, we were uh, uh, first uh, building up the Gluon framework. So one of them was to make the maintenance of the firmware for the community developers as easy as possible. So um, instead of uh, make, uh, creating a fork of um, some base repository and adjusting things in it, we just had one generic base repository and uh, a community uh, could just put a little configuration file uh, in the right place and then build uh, optimized adjusted firmware for their community. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, these, uh, uh, this configuration is a so-called site repository. We'll also show how that uh, looks like a bit, li a bit later. Um, yeah, and um, to make it really easy f uh, for um, firmware uh, builders to uh, make things work, we also thought it was important that no actually uh, knowledge of the underlying configuration of OpenWRT lead is necessary. Of course, it helps, but um, it's actually possible with Gluon to build up a mesh network with, uh, without deeper knowledge of the underlying technology. So another point that was important was modularity, um, because we know Freifunk is not only um, a way of um, giving internet access to people, but it's also something uh, communities experiment with. So they want to adjust the firmware to replace parts, um, to try out uh, new technologies, new network topologies, things like that. We aren't quite there uh, uh, regarding modularity yet. So at the moment, uh, Batman Advance is the only protocol that um, is supported, but we are actively working on, uh, making, uh, on adding support for other routing protocols. Yeah. And the last point for uh, the end user, the person who just wants uh, to add a device uh, to a community mesh network, um, it should be as easy as possible. So, um, Gluon is almost zero config, or a Gluon based firmware is almost zero config. So, as you have a uh, um, uh, first, uh, uh, first boot setup wizard that uh, basically asks you how you want to call your node, you'll, you'll also see that later. Okay, then I will continue. So, we started with just having these five to seven communities in mind to really unite them. And um, yeah, like Matthias said, try to do it really easy for those guys to jump onto the glue on boat. And whoops, now we're looking at uh, the map, how many communities have actually joined. And the whole thing uh, basically grew up to 300 more or, and, or over 300 communities. And we have about uh, 35,000 nodes running in Germany currently running glue on. 
So, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, now I will uh, continue with the features. So, um, uh, this firmware can do, of course, it can do meshing. So, like Matthias said, currently uh, Batman Advance is the main protocol we are using. And it, we also support Batman Advance Legacy, how we now nicknamed it. So, um, which is basically the old version from 2013, with that, which uh, is not compatible with the current uh, version. So, right, roaming was one of the features of it, so that it's quite seamless for any user. And, um, right, but there are also some ongoing experiments with Babel, so um, some people are working on some integration of that, and we also wanted to keep this um, roaming feature, and therefore there are also some guys working on a layer 3 roaming daemon, which is supposed to be independent of Babel, so we hope that we might be that generic that we can also just replace Babel with all this R, BMX, or whatever. So that's currently ongoing work. Of course, um, meshing takes place, for instance, over Wi-Fi. Um, your firmware to use ad hoc mode or 802.11s. Um, well, and um, yeah, that's one of the more debated features in the start, uh, which is uh, meshing or VPN. So uh, in Lubeck it was basically like uh, we wanted to start a mesh company and just that maybe we can use VPN to start the whole thing, to get some critical because it was for us um, with some node in the university cellar and one node uh, at home at my place, one node at another guy's place, but we didn't have really line of sight. So we thought could start with VPN, then the whole thing grows, and then we can get rid of it again. And so there was the VPN to interconnect the clouds. However, um, there's a second reason as well for the VPN now these days, which is um, to basically ease the sharing of internet bandwidth. Um, there's a quite, there's a certain problem typical to Germany. I will not go too much into details over this, um, but uh, there was a real need for something like uh, anonymizing VPNs or some way to actually share uh, your internet connection maybe with your guests or uh, a hotel wants to share the internet connection or yeah whatever. Um, so there's uh, not just a VPN to interconnect the clouds but also to provide upstream internet access over this VPN. So in this case you have um, a Freifunk router here and it's connected to your home router and over this home router, there's an encrypted connection to a Freifunk server. And there, at this point, um, the whole traffic enters the internet. And anybody um, else does not know from which home router does the traffic actually come from. So that's probably one of the reasons for the quick growth as well. So, and of course, meshing. Uh, this is one tweet from Freifunk Bremen. <laughs> Our internet connection is at the Breminale. It is so stable that even bikes are connected securely. So some guy just um, tied the bike to the cable. <laughs> okay. So what other features have we of meshing? So um, it still was and still is a great big experiment. I mean, it's, there are a lot of um, networks which have never, or as far as I know, there were not any layer two mesh networks of the size before. So we always had to have some way to react quickly to maybe add additional features for scalability, which we did not anticipate before. So therefore, we also have an auto-updater. And um, with this auto-updater, of course, there's always debate about auto-updates. Um, there are some pros and cons about this uh, compared to a manual update. And um, to mitigate some of these, we have um, certain signature process, so usually a community says we have five people who are able to assign the whole firmware, and if three people sign the firmware, then the update will roll out onto all nodes. And um, before you roll out an update to all nodes, um, we, you can also select a branch, so we usually have a few nodes which are on a beta branch, or even a few nodes on an experimental branch for nightly builds. So, okay. Then, of course, like I guess many mesh communities have, we have a status page as well for to just check, uh, is my router meshing fine? Is it connecting well um, via VPN, Wi-Fi, or whatever? And, um, well, one of the 
differences probably here is that the status page here, it's actually running on the router itself. And it's usually in most communities reachable over the internet as well, to IPv6. So um, each of our nodes has an IPv6 address as well, usually. And um, Right, and um, that's also one of the things um, Gluon has uh, by default, that every device can just have an IPv6 address and contact each other. Uh, can con you can, every host can connect to each other host. And for um, IPv4, it's usually a little different. There, we mostly have, or most communities are running some, or a bunch of DHCP servers or gateway servers, which are connected or are located at some place with a more reliability. However, there are also some communities who are experimenting with a gateway running locally next to their uplink or at home and yeah. So, okay, so that's the status page we have here. Uh, we will also show it later in the live demo, demo I think. And uh, that's also the response team. Maybe I hand over to you now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, one interesting feature of Gluon is the so-called D. It's basically a little um, piece of software that generates monitoring information, like well, many other uh, uh, pieces of software do. Um, so uh, this little daemon generates a JSON structure. I don't know. We could uh, also show the uh, data um, uh, in the live presentation. Uh, and uh, this data is also uh, what the status page is based on. So all information you just saw on the screenshot and will see in the live demo uh, can be queried over the mesh. So for example, um, by a central mapping server like is uh, common in many communities. Um, there are two ways to get the data from uh, respondee. Uh, one is uh, Alfred, the, uh, the um, information exchange demon by the Batman developers. And Respondee also has uh, an own protocol based on UDP um, that we basically developed because uh, back then we weren't happy with the way Alfred worked. We aren't really happy with the new protocol either, so we'll probably uh, replace that one with, the, with a different protocol at some point. Um, we are also thinking about replacing our custom JSON format, which predates NetJSON, with NetJSON at some point. Okay, so much uh, about the features of Gluon, and now we we'll actually show some of them. Okay, looks good. So first we will just show how easy it is to build a firm drone. So basically you need three commands to build a firmware. You need to get the glue on code. Let's go with a, with a prepared version. So uh, here are the commands you need uh, to build Gluon. Um, the, you need to get the Gluon code, you need to get your site configuration, and you, oh, no, it's the four commands. You need uh, then to call make update and then the actual uh, make for the target you want to build. For. So, 
So Okay, so I think we should have a look at this site configuration because that is the most complicated part of creating a new Gluon backend. So the two most important files in the site repository, in the site directory, are the site.make and the site.conf. The site.make configures the Gluon build, while the site.conf configures the runtime of Gluon. So in the site.make, we have a list of modules, which are basically OpenWP packages that you want in your firmware. As you see, there is a very long list of packages here um, because uh, Gluon is very modular and ma uh, many uh, features have been split out as uh, individual mod modules. So you can really build uh, the firmware the way you want. And a bit lower, we also see in the build configuration things like the version number you want to give your firmware. Um, because often communities don't actually need to re release one firmware release with e each of our Gluon upstream release. So it's possible for the communities to define their own uh, version scheme. The other file is the site conf. This is uh, 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 basically uh, a Lua file, but it doesn't really, uh, you don't need to know Lua, it's just uh, using Lua as a data structure. Um, and there you can actually define what uh, the firmware will do. So most of these things, most of these options are optional. Um, so you only need to include them if you, uh, you have uh, the corresponding module in your site MK. So um, yeah, unfortunately, it's the uh, lines are a bit long on the projectors, so you can't see all of it, but you might uh, get an idea of it. So there was configuration uh, for the name of your community, then there are some Wi-Fi options if you uh, want to use ad hoc or 11S mode, what channels you want to use. Um, and uh, further down, there is a configuration for things like the Mesh VPN. Then more Mesh VPN, even more Mesh VPN. And, there you saw something like bandwidth limits because it's possible in Gluon to, to uh, define limits in the, config, in the uh, first configuration without how much of your bandwidth of your internet connection you want to provide, if at all. And we have reached the auto updater part of the configuration file. So here you can see the different branches and lists of signatures of the developers that are allowed to sign images for the auto app data. So this uh, was our um, walkthrough through the build configuration of Gluon. We have another demo prepared. So I have two questions. Um, there's a site.mk, so there you can find uh, packages. Uh, so you have to, to define the packages for all of your router models. So in other words, for all your routers, it's the same list of packages for your whole city. Uh, basically, that's the basic configuration. You have one list of packages, but it's also possible to adjust the list depending on the target or even individual models you build for. Um, of course, uh, users can build their own firmware, but it's not very common. So usually 
the, um, the whole city uses the same list of packages. Thank you. The other question is, um, I have seen that there are the public keys for signing of the auto updates. Um, how does it practic practically work? So, uh, for example, there's an admin who's called Linus, and he just decides that this update is good. He just signs the images for all targets. There is uh, a manifest file. I think we can also show that file. Well, basically, the manifest contains the, uh, the uh, hashes of all the images for the models, the version number, and the, the branch, and the date uh, the manifest was generated. And this manifest file is then signed. Ah, OK. So that means that uh, Linus can sign a firmware which was never flashed. That is possible. Thank you. Uh, isn't it dangerous? <laughs> well, basically, there is no way to actually verify that uh, an image has been flashed. Um, there's no way... Uh, um, I don't, um, there is a way you have to flash it. <laughs> you have to flash it before you can sign it. Right, and that's why we have these different branches. So like I said before, we usually start with the experimental branch, so some nodes which are flashed automatically. And if we see, okay, they all come up again, then we start to flash another set of routers, or then um, there are some people who have selected to be a volunteer for the beta testing, and then the update rolls out. All these nodes are coming back up again, then we start to sign the firmware. And we need at least, um, I think in Lübeck, at least two signatures. So I cannot sign it alone. I cannot do the whole update alone. But uh, at least two of our four partners uh, have to sign it. OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Um, the, the process to flash automatically is a script or is a, can, can you provide more information about it? Okay, yeah, it's basically uh, fetching the firmware from the site. So um, the URL, it's configured uh, in the site.conf, which you have seen before. And uh, it downloads the image, and it downloads the manifest file. And then it checks whether um, all the signatures on this manifest file are okay. And after that, only then, it starts to actually flash um, with the firmware after checking that the firmware actually matches the same hash number written in this um, manifest file. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so, yes, it's a script, no? I mean, it's, okay. yeah, it's But uh, you have virtual machines, you have several models. I'm interested in the details of this first step of checking the last version of the firmware. Sorry, I didn't quite get the question. So the question is, more details about this quality assurance you're doing, because I think it's very interesting, and I didn't know that you were doing that. Uh, for example, you have routers like this, how many of them, if you use virtual machines to, because you have limited number of times of flashing devices, no? Or not? Or you didn't experience? Uh, uh, we didn't really experience problems with broken flash chips. So um, there are some uh, nodes on the experimental branch in uh, uh, most Gluon networks that basically are flashed uh, every night with a new automatically built and signed uh, nightly. And uh, hardware failures aren't very common. Virtual machines you don't use? Well. 
Um, yeah, it's it's possible to build Gluon for x86, and um, so there are some virtual machines running with Gluon. So, so that is one possibility to verify an image before actually flashing it on hardware. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, the uh, upload or the download, better say, from the clients. Uh, how this is regulated if uh, the clients depend on upload or uplink routers and if they are not direct on uplink, how do they get the images? Because if you start flashing the, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the routers, we make the uplink, the rest of the routers can't get a download. So how this is, is there a regulation, a, a setup, or, or something like this? Um, there is no regulation for that. So we just try to keep the mesh uh, backwards compatible with each update. So even uh, if a, a, a node has been upgraded, all the, the other nodes just are just connected uh, to the internet through the mesh, will still be able to reach the, the upgrade servers. There are uh. some ideas to make, uh, create a fallback mode. Some communities already experimented uh, with such a mode that will actually s switch to client mode uh, when for upgrades when a uh, node notices that it can't really connect to the mesh anymore, but uh, that is still in development. Well, we, we, tried, we tried to think about the project and made in a very small network, like six routers, I, uh, with a two, two uplink. Uh, to think about how to do it, and I, uh, we found out it's a really complicated thing uh, to make a fallback, uh, because if you got stuck with a network with a lot of routers, uh, which are in one way or the other, some way along the road, uh, are incompatible with the old version to the new version, so uh, there is a high chance you uh, uh, get disconnected, a part of the network, uh, from uh, the uplink and uh, if uh, they fall back to uh, a, a situation to a fallback software the fallback must be in a way so the uplink routers will make a connection even to the fallback software you understand what I'm trying to say uh, if, if you have part of the network are uh, getting a fallback for whatever incompatible reason right. you have right. with a, uh, let's say you have 25 routers and you upgrade this, you have for uh, some kind of long time uh, discrepancies between the softwares which are running. Right. You know? Yeah, that's also the basically the main reason why we are still keeping this Batman Advance legacy package around because we currently are not able with this auto updater to switch between different routing protocols or to um, well, set, uh, reconf or set different channels, wireless settings, and so on. But um, well, so far we, we hope to get this into the auto updater, but it's not there yet. But the good thing is, as soon as somebody implements this, we can roll this out, this new auto updater, with this auto updater. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> well, well, why do I ask? Uh, we we had in the small community, which are two, the two people about about these things. And at the end of the year, to switch to from the homemade software to a standard software like Gluon. And because uh, uh, we have been thinking about the problematics which arise in the minute you make an auto update or a, a manual update, it's the same problem. Uh, what happens if your network crashes? You know, so physically at the end of the day, somebody has to go out there. You know, and I uh, uh, flash that on site, wherever they are. You know, I. Uh, um, uh, I don't quite understand how you can crash a whole mesh network. Well, okay, but, if, uh, if, maybe if we there can is, if, discuss later. If, if you or? do an upgrade, an auto upgrade, or manual upgrade to a router, hmm. uh, which does not uh, follow up the upgrade and falls back to some function. And the rest of the network is upgraded. Do you guarantee the not upgraded router still is in communication with no, the rest don't. of the system? No, we don't. <laughs> no, you cannot yes, guarantee yes, this. That's not okay, okay. So uh, uh, you always have to think about there is a possibility 
uh, yeah, one or two or some routers, they go off the grid. Depending on what settings you're changing, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. So basically, we just never change settings that would break the compatibility, so it just keeps working, but of course, that uh, also limits it, it limits us in what we can do with an upgrade at the moment. As I said, we are working on a more flexible upgrader that will be able to handle such situations, but, but we aren't there yet. Okay, so the next demo is um, is um, our first uh, configuration wizard, the so-called config mode. So we see that you are doing some stuff, but can you also explain what you're trying to do, what you're doing? We were just uh, setting the node to the config mode and trying to connect to it. Um, so after flashing uh, a Gluon-based firmware, um, there will, it will usually be in the config mode. You can also build Gluon firmware without, without the config mode, but using the config mode is the default or the recommended setting. Um, so, this is um, the configuration page. Let's start at the top. So, you can give your node a name. You can enable uh, the Mesh VPN. And you uh, can um, add this t uh, tick to uh, make the node visible on a map server. And finally, well, if, if you want to show it in the map, of course, uh, you need to um, put in some coordinates. And you uh, can give some contact information. Uh, we deliberately don't make any uh, rules what kind of, con uh, of uh, contact information uh, people should give. So it can be a mail address, an, a chat handle. Some people also put their phone number there. Um, well, and so there's this single page, and then you press the save and restart button on the bottom, um, and the node will be will reboot then, and be, will well, it, it will be fully set up. There's also an advanced settings page, or rather multiple pages for those uh, who want to con control a bit more of uh, their setup, but uh, this is uh, usually not necessary for the average Joe or Jane. Okay, are there any more questions? Um, does that dashboard also give the uh, the user access to the like the full OpenWRT uh, Lucy interface? Um, the config mode was originally based on Lucy, but it was not really easily possible to install it uh, on a Glue node at the same time with the actual Lucy. So, so um, but. Um, 
Usually Lucy is not too useful on a Glue node because its network conversion is very specific and so you would uh, need uh, to know how the interfaces are set up and so on very, very deeply to actually make um, meaningful changes using Lucy. Okay. Any further other questions? So, uh, just, a, just a kind of a summary. So, you're simplifying the process of rolling out updates in an existing network, but you can't, which is, which is already a, a, a big enough problem and, 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 and good that you make it easier. But what you still can't do, and, and which is even more difficult, is uh, you can't solve the problem of uh, changing protocol within an existing network, right? Because that was the discussion uh, we, we had a few minutes ago, uh, which was, um, so, because if you change the, the protocol or some, some other settings that make, make the, the previous and the new uh, firmware version incompatible, then uh, you're risking that you're just breaking the network, or most likely you're breaking the network, right? That's correct. As mentioned, we are working on a solution. There are ideas, uh, but uh, well, there is also some experimental code, um, but uh, it's not finished yet. I see. Uh, and uh, just, just, just out of curiosity, um, are you thinking, or is there some projects, maybe not related to Gluon, but maybe you have heard of, of some stuff uh, where people are working on, you know, some some kind of um, uh, sideband or out-of-band communication for, for you know, for getting connection to nodes that are to, to solving such a problem of changing changing protocols and losing the connection to 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 nodes that are misconfigured. You know, I'm I'm talking about this kind of you know, uh, LoRa radios and Zigbee radios that you can use as a fallback communication to to lost nodes. I'm just asking if there's maybe something you've heard of and that somebody's working on. Well, I've heard of that some people were doing something. Or so one of the ideas is that um, a node which is not in, uh, has no connectivity anymore will just fall back to a stupid client mode. Because we have an open mesh network uh, where everyone can connect. So the router itself can also just connect as if it were a, a dumb client. And then it would try to get the new image from there will update itself and then will be fully meshed again. So that's the current idea, but that's not been implemented yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a good idea, yeah? I like okay. it. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have actually two questions. And the first one is uh, related to, uh, to the source code. I've heard you, you, you are switching to of the bash scripts to Lua. Uh, how is that going? I mean, uh, does it work out? Uh, and uh, the qu second question is um, about the image size, um, which is uh, becoming of, uh, sort of a problem for uh, devices with four megabytes of flash. Um, so is the next Gluon uh, release going to support those devices still, or is it, uh, uh, how hard will it be? Thanks. What is the first question again? <laughs> oh, sorry, I think it got lost, um, yeah. Uh, it was about uh, Lua, using Lua in the uh, back end for, uh, instead of bash script. Uh, and uh, I was just uh, asking, uh, how is it going? I mean, uh, is it successful? Have you been able to replace every, or I don't know what you actually do it, use it for. And um, yeah, um, you use Lua for a lot of bash scripts. Uh, and if it's working out very nicely, or if there are or goal. Uh, I think using Lua has uh, worked pretty nicely for us. It makes uh, the scripts more maintainable because we can mod easily modularize them and have a proper programming language uh, which uh, w uh, with um, somewhat nicer syntax and more features than Bash. Um, and especially for things like working with JSON or similar, similar um, tasks, Lua is much uh, better suited uh, than Bash. Also, as uh, shell scripts are uh, executed by BusyBox on OpenWRT, that's also really slow, usually. 
So the second question was about uh, the yeah. image size. Uh, the for image size. For megabyte flash devices. Uh, is the next Lagoon release going to support those devices, or uh, when does it will end? We were actually having some problems with getting Gluon to fit onto the 4 megabyte devices when we were switching from Chaos Comma to Lead. Um, we have uh, mitigated this, this in two ways. Um, we have created, um, or we have split an AR71XX tiny target out of the AR71XX generic target that uh, just contains all the 4 megabyte devices. Um, this target um, does, doesn't have OPKG anymore, so it's, uh, as it uh, was never really possible to install additional software with such a small flash anyways, we thought it uh, isn't a great loss just to remove the package manager and all the package maintenance uh, uh, database and so on, and that actually freed up a few erase blocks. Uh, the other th thing we did is we uh, uh, well, re re replaced um, the uh, Lua, ba uh, uh, the, the replaced the Lucy base of the config mode uh, with uh, well, basically a minimal version of Lucy. So we were uh, pulling in the, the Lucy lib base module just uh, for very few features we are we're actually using, so we were able to greatly reduce the size, I think, from more than 120 kilobytes to less than 20 kilobytes. Um, what's the package format that you use for Gluon, and how can I build my own packages? Is this this old IPK-based thing where you have make files and, and stuff like that? Um, we use uh, normal OpenWRT lead packages, so, well, the package files are, op uh, are OPKGs. Um, and maybe some of uh, the packages could also be just moved into one of the other OpenWRT uh, repositories at some point. Okay, one last question, anybody? Maybe? Doesn't seem so? So, thank you very much for your talk. <laughs>